While many of us were afraid of the dark as children, a man who only identified himself as Patrick had a real reason to be terrified when he was a kid. Every time he laid his head on his pillow, he had to deal with the shocking truth that his parents were wrong. The darkness of his room harbored something evil. You see, years later, when he was able to look upon his experiences with a rational adult mind, Patrick still felt that some of the things he experienced just couldn't be explained away. Now, eventually, he reached out to the late paranormal author and researcher Brad Steiger to share snippets from his adolescence growing up in the mid to late 1980s. Patrick would tell Brad that he would visit his aunt's vacation home in Katahmet area of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and this would be every Thanksgiving. It was here that the majority of his encounters would unfold. Now, Patrick said that one of his earliest experiences occurred while reading a book on true hauntings that his mother had given him. Now, he soon found himself engrossed in the pages and, quite frankly, a little spooked. Now, today, Patrick realizes that this might have made him a little skittish, maybe a little jumpy, but even with that awareness, he cannot dismiss what would happen next. Patrick says that he was reading the book on his aunt's sun porch when the window behind him slammed shut entirely on its own. Now, after he got over his initial fright, he examined the window, searching for any sort of logical explanation. However, folks, the window, which was secured by a hook and eye latch and open outward, didn't seem capable of slamming with the force it did that very day. So was it just a random occurrence? Perhaps. I mean, Patrick is open to that possibility, but perhaps it was not. As he later would recount, it may have been a coincidence, but in light of what happened later, may not have been. Now, Patrick explains that shortly thereafter, either that evening or the following night, he was upstairs reading another book, and he was sitting sideways on the bed with his back against the wall and his feet dangling over the edge when he thought he felt something, something out of place. It was a gentle side-to-side -side swaying that seemed to be rocking the very mattress on which he was on. Now, his first instinct was that his mind was now playing tricks on him, but a quick glimpse over the bed made it obvious. The bed was indeed moving on its own. The motion began slow and gentle, but as he watched, grew more and more aggressive. And soon the entire bed was violently shaking back and forth so forcefully, the headboard began banging the wall. Now, as he struggled to try and comprehend what was happening, Patrick came to the conclusion that one of his brothers must be hiding beneath the bed, playing a trick on him. So he got smart. He leaned over forward, looked under the bed and shouted, you jerk, cut it out. Or at least that's what he wanted to say. The only thing he managed was the first word. The rest of the sentence caught in his throat. <laughs> when he noticed there was no one under the bed. Now, at that same moment, the mattress whoo, immediately stopped shaking. It was a terrifying experience, but only one of several such encounters that would leave Patrick with the suspicion that something else lived in his aunt's house. Now, on numerous visits, I mean, at least a half a dozen, his alarm clock radio would go off erratically, sending shrieks and static through his room at night, and this consistently occurred just as he was about to doze off to sleep. This was far less terrifying than the other noises heard in the middle of the night. Now and then, he would hear someone outside his closed bedroom door, and not the heavy sound of footsteps, but rather the telltale creak of someone shifting their weight on the wooden floorboards of the old house. We all know what that sounds like. In fact, some of the most dramatic instances suggested the presence of an actual malevolent spirit in the home. Now, whether or not it ever belonged to a human being, it seemed to be female. 
Patrick would say this, Awake in the living room after everyone had gone to bed, I heard a woman's voice and music playing upstairs. I went to the foot of the stairs and listened for a while and then went back to watching TV. My aunt came down about 20 minutes later and I asked her who was playing the music and she said, Music? She hadn't heard anything. I found out the next day that nobody had even brought a radio. Now this same presence might have awoken Patrick late one night. From out of a deep sleep, he found himself suddenly awake with the understanding, the absolute certainty that something else was in his room. Then from somewhere deep in the shadows, he heard a voice uttering complete gibberish. Pot, pot, Alan, Alan. It seemed to say, pot, pot, Alan, Alan. Terrified, he managed to find enough courage to leap out of bed and turn the light on. And the moment it flicked on, the room was empty. Patrick was never able to make sense of what these words might mean until many years later. He would explain his suspicions in his correspondence with Brad Steiger, saying this, and aside on the house. For the longest time, I thought that it was related to the serial killer Jane Toppin, who murdered four people in 1901 at a house around the corner. In fact, the next street is called Mystery Lane after these murders. This would have been Alden Davis, his wife, and two daughters. I did some property research and found that Alden Davis had once owned the land my aunt's house is on, a part of the Katomet Grover and Shore Company, but it was apparently sold before a house was built on the property in the 1870s or 1880s. As if this connection wasn't unsettling enough, Patrick discovered that Alden Davis was once a follower of a preacher named Charles Freeman. Now, apparently, Freeman claimed to have heard the voice of God himself in the 1870s and determined that the Lord God wanted him to sacrifice yes, sacrifice a member of his own family. Now, the very next night, this same voice instructed the preacher to murder his youngest daughter under the belief that she would miraculously resurrect three days later. Charles Freeman's plan was cut short after Alden Davis's surviving daughter learned of the murder she told her boyfriend, who just so happened to be a member of local law enforcement, and then obviously Charles Freeman was arrested. Now, when Patrick shared all of this information about the dark history surrounding their aunt's property, his face turned pale. Do you remember when you told me the thing in your bedroom, he would ask. Of course, Patrick replied. It was nonsense. Pot, pot, Allen, Allen. Now, Patrick's brother waited a moment and then said, or was it saying, Pat, Pat, Alden, Alden? Could the thing in Patrick's bedroom have been saying his first name and Aldrin Davis's first name? If so, what did that imply and what was the message? Luckily, Patrick escaped his childhood unscathed, at least for the most part, but the activity in his aunt's house would continue. The annual tradition of meeting there every Thanksgiving took a turn for the bazaar in November of 2005. You see, Patrick's aunt had just driven down from her condominium in Boston to prepare the Cape Cod house for everyone's arrival. Now, after parking her car and walking to the doorstep, however, she noticed that the front door was open if ever so slightly. Cautiously, Patrick's aunt pushed open the door so she could look inside, and there in the darkness sat a set of keys. Seeing and hearing nothing else out of the ordinary, she stepped inside, grabbed them, and examined their shape. They looked like just any other keys in her purse. And sure enough, a quick test on the front door revealed them as an identical set of spare keys. But here's the issue. She had never made any spare keys, like ever. So where had this spare set of keys come from? Fully unnerved, Patrick's aunt called out to ask if anyone was in the house. There was no answer. Figures. So feeling relatively certain that no one else was inside, she began searching the rooms one by one. Now, when she at last reached the room in which Patrick stayed as a child, she found it in complete disarray. Even stranger, it was occupied. There in the middle of the mess, a screech owl had taken up residence. It was apparently why the room was in shambles, but obviously didn't explain the spare set of keys. 
Now faced with both a trespasser and a wild animal, Patrick's aunt wasted no time calling both the police and animal control with Patrick saying this. The guy from animal control went in, opened a bedroom window, and told her that the owl would leave when it got dark, which it did. Nobody has any idea how any of this happened. I began to wonder if there wasn't something more to it. I did brief research on owl symbolism and found that it symbolizes either evil or wisdom, the ability to see in the dark. I'm not sure if this is a symbol or just a wild, bizarre coincidence. Her house, by the way, was in no way burglarized. Thanksgiving 2005 then came and went uneventfully. And it wasn't until three months later that Patrick experienced another bizarre incident. But this time, not at his aunt's house, but in his own home. Now, sometime in February of 2006, Patrick was at home watching TV in the basement, and out of the corner of his eye, he caught something flying around the room. At first, he thought it was just an insect, maybe a moth or a fly, and then he remembered that, oh yeah, it's the dead of winter, and that seemed very unlikely. Now, Patrick could barely focus on this flying thing, and so he decided to try and capture a still image of the intruder on his digital camera. While most of what he took showed nothing, he claimed that one photograph showed a small green glowing ball suspended in midair, no bigger than a quarter. Patrick was feeling very unnerved at this point, and it would only get worse the following day. He said this, The next morning, at about 5 a.m., I was walking from my bedroom to the bathroom when I thought I heard a clear whisper in my ear say, Pat! My response was to say, aloud, Psh! Yeah, right? And I went on to take a shower. Later, that night, while in bed, I heard the whisper again. I turned on my computer, downloaded a quick audio clip of forest noises, and played it in a loop so I could get to sleep. The next night, I set up a radio and had it play loudly while I went to sleep, so that I wouldn't hear any whispering. When I awoke in the morning, I found that the radio had been switched off. It's very low-tech and couldn't have switched off by itself. That night, I figured I'd try to catch something on video and set my radio up the way I'd done it the night before, but pointed my Sony Handycam at it, but to no avail. The radio was still playing the next morning. Patrick said that at this point he had had enough, so he decided to conduct a late night session to try and capture EVP or electric voice phenomena. Now, hopefully any answers he received might shed some light on what was harassing him. Now, while his recordings didn't make any of the events in his life any clearer, they did bring him a small measure of comfort while he claimed that some snippets of audio sounded like drumming and others sounded like men chanting. There was also a woman's voice which clearly said, be strong. Another response, less clear, sounded like something along the lines of, be cool. Concluding his story, Patrick would say this, I listened to the recordings over and over and finally grew calm. My nervousness left me. I said aloud to the room, you guys are just messing with me, aren't you? Whatever seemed to be in my house left, and I haven't felt a presence since. Now this story leaves us, like Patrick, with far more questions than answers. What was haunting his aunt's house, the ghost of a serial killer, or was it in the same demonic voice that told Charles Goodman to sacrifice his daughter? Now, when he published Patrick's story in his book, Real Monsters, Gruesome Critters, and Beasts from the Dark Side, Brad Steiger placed it alongside other tales of what can only be described as boogeymen. Now, although the thought of today, as silly as a term that encompasses things that go bump in the night, people from antiquity through the modern era have reported any number of disturbing creatures lurking in their bedrooms. The boogeyman's origins come from the word bogey, which at various times was used as a nickname for goblins, fairies, and even the devil himself. It may have originated from the word bogey or bug, two Middle English terms used to describe a scarecrow. The name also seems to be rooted in tales of the Bogart, a household spirit from English folklore. Whatever its origins, the term continues to evolve to this day. 
airplane fighter pilots sometimes describe enemies as bogies. We refer to insects as bugs, and some rural populations use the term booger to describe cryptids like Bigfoot, specifically wood booger. Now, all these terms can trace their origins back to the boogeyman and, in turn, these older traditions. Now, sometimes these modern boogeymen even seem to come from these stereotypical sources of terror that frighten so many children, underneath the bed and in the closet. For example, Dr. Simon Young collected a disturbing tale from Pennsylvania that happened sometime in the 2010s. The witness, not a child, but a late middle-aged woman, we'll call Jane, said that she awoke from the verge of sleep early one morning, only to find her bedroom brighter than expected. When she took a closer look, Jane realized that the light seemed to be coming from her closet. Now, before she realized that her phone was on her nightstand, Jane thought that maybe she had left it in the closet for some reason. Now, in the face of this new mystery, the hair on her arms began standing on end, and she also noticed a profound silence that filled the entire house. Jane would write this. I stared at the light for a few more seconds. Then suddenly it moved. It jumped from the closet to the ceiling in a single flash. It was coming towards me. Then it flashed again and moved further to my bed. Then it hid behind my boyfriend. I thought, okay, it's a lightning bug is all. Satisfied with this explanation, Jane laid back down, but the flashing continued. This time, the light rose from behind her sleeping boyfriend and then headed back in the direction of the closet. And there, it hovered in the air, pulsating. Realizing that no one would believe her, Jane whirled out of bed, grabbed her phone, and managed to snap a picture. But as so often happens, the results were blurry and inconclusive. Gee, imagine that. The light then disappeared within Jane's closet. Now, Jane chose to interpret this interaction within the framework of fairy folklore, but other encounters with boogeymen are a bit less easy to categorize and far more frightening. Brad Steiger recounted the story of a young girl named Martha who, while playing at her friend's house one night, agreed to a game of hide and seek. Now, Martha's young friends decided to give the game a new twist. They wanted to play it in the dark, something I would have never done. After switching off all the lights in the house, shh, the girls then decided that Martha would be it, the one to do the seeking while all her friends hid. Now, even though it was already dark, Martha closed her eyes and then she began her countdown, her voice drowning out the sound of her friends as they scuttled towards their hiding place. Now, when she was done, Martha opens her eyes and slowly and methodically, she began searching out in every room, and one by one, each hiding space failed to yield any sign of her friends. They were not in the kitchen, they were not in the bathrooms, they were not in any of the bedrooms, with one exception. There was one final bedroom that Martha had not investigated. She knew that her friends must be somewhere inside. In fact, Martha said this, I started to walk down the hallway, feeling against the walls. I entered the doorway, and I had this amazingly bad feeling in my stomach. I felt like going into the room would just be horrible, but as uncertain as I was feeling, I did it anyway. I walked in and discovered that this room was a spare bedroom. I knew there was a bed, and I assumed my friends were underneath it and ready to freak me out, so I thought, better just get it over with. I reached under the bed and began to feel around a bit. That's when it happened. This enormous spark occurred under the bed. I could see its brightness, and it was loud too. Too. The shock vibrated through my whole body. I immediately began to pull back my hand, but it was stopped. Something grabbed my arm. It started to pull me under the bed. Luckily, I was able to retrieve control of my arm and ran from the room. I screamed for my friends and they popped out and turned on the lights. Now, when the lights came on, young Martha fully expected to see her friends drag themselves out from under the bed. But instead, folks, they came rushing up to her from somewhere in the basement, a spot she had simply overlooked. Now, for a moment, Martha entertained the possibility that they had been beneath the bed and snuck past her. But no, that was far less believable than the possibility that she had overlooked them. 
Now, whatever had been underneath the bed had not been any of her friends, and when they all looked, could not be found. Now, another story of boogeyman or boogie beast hiding under the bed comes to us from Russia. Now, according to a 1992 Fate magazine article written by Paul Stonehill, a household in Petropavlovsk had a terrifying encounter with a bedroom intruder the year prior. The entire Ivanitsky family was awakened by a loud chirping noise that sounded like an entire truckload of crickets. Now, this sound continued for numerous days and nights until 10 days later, one of the family members spotted something under the bed hiding. Now, whatever it was, it appeared alive and looked either like a small dog or a huge rat. In either case, the family was eager to be rid the pest, grabbed a pair of slippers, and they tossed them at the creature under the bed. In response, hear me out here, this is where the story gets truly unbelievable. The thing apparently twitched and began to grow and grow and grow until it was three times the size it had originally appeared. The creature then apparently went on the offensive, lashing out with an appendage that the Ivanitskys described as long, prehensile like an elephant's trunk. The limbs snatched and grabbed at the family's ankles, but never managed to get a grip most likely because by this point, everybody was beating at the trunk with whatever they could lay their hands on. The children even grabbed some household cleaning products and began spraying the appendage, hoping that the chemicals might drive it back to whatever depths of hell it came from. Now, something must have worked because the creature retreated back to the farthest corner under the mattress where it lay still. At last, the family was able to get a good look. And what they saw surprised them. Two paws with three digits each, a body covered in short bluish hair, and most bizarrely, a pair of wide bat-like wings nearly five feet wide. But it was the face of the beast that disturbed them the most. It looked like a plaster mold of a human face. The forehead was large, as were the eyes, while the mouth was almost non-existent. Above that sat a nose, but a triangle-shaped hole, presumably the opening through which its trunk extended. Now, according to the story, the Ivanitsky family successfully defended their home that day. The animal, or demon, appeared lifeless. However, the father was more afraid of the government than the creature itself, concerned that they might have killed a protected species, disposed the body in a nearby ditch, and within days, the remains had suspiciously vanished. Now, something worth considering is the fact that in all these stories thus far, none of the boogeymen have ever physically hurt any of the children. Yeah, I mean, they've scared them, but nobody has been wounded. But the child in our next story was not so lucky. Now, according to Brad Steiger, in June of 2004, he received what he described as a very disturbing letter from a teenager named Lisa who said that she and her parents first noticed something was wrong when her little brother, Bobby, at the age of six, started to get bruises and cuts on his arms and legs. Now, Lisa went on to explain that the entire family was obviously quite concerned when they noticed Bobby's injuries. But each time they asked how these wounds were inflicted, Bobby would just say that they came from that man who comes into my bedroom and hits me with a belt. At this, their mother would simply roll her eyes and clean Bobby's cuts, suspecting that they were just injuries from too much roughhousing, right? Because that's how little boys generally are. However, all that changed when Bobby acted absolutely terrified as she tucked him in one night. He demanded that his mother sleep with him. She denied his request, but left the nightlight on. Now, the following morning, Bobby's injuries were different. They were also more severe. Below his right eye, there was now a scratch so deep it could almost be called a cut. Now, Bobby's mother figured he must have rubbed his eye while sleeping and inflicted the injury himself, so she trimmed his fingernails. But the trauma kept unfolding. A week after, Bobby awoke with a massive bruise that crawled from his back all the way across both shoulder blades. It was so painful that Bobby could barely move. At last, Bobby's mother began to understand that her son was not harming himself. She took him to the doctor, who of course, come on guys, recognized it for what it was, abuse, and since he knew the family well enough, 
he asked Bobby's mother if another caretaker had been watching over the boy. The bruises were so extensive, he assumed they must have come from a babysitter with a very bad temper. Now, Bobby's mother was shocked. She never had anyone babysit her children. So she told the doctor the same thing, which left everybody completely perplexed. Now, things came to a head on a Monday morning. Bobby woke up screaming. His arm was hurt, sending him into complete agony. And in her written letter to Brad Steiger, Bobby's sister, Lisa, explained how they learned the true nature of Bobby's disturbing nighttime visitor. Check this out. Mom rushed him to the hospital. His arm was broken. I learned from a neighbor while Bobby and Mom were in the hospital that a man used to live in that house in the 1960s with his two sons and daughter. They were all under seven years of age. He beat them, and one, the older son, even died from a beating. He was arrested and killed himself in jail. The younger boy and girl still lived in the neighborhood. I went to school with one of their children, and I went over to visit. When Mom came to pick me up, the daughter noticed Bobby's broken arm. She asked mom what happened, and mom told her of the strange things that had been happening in Bobby's room. The girl got a look of terrible fear on her face. She advised mom to move away. She said she didn't know about ghosts, but she was sure Bobby was in danger. Now, according to Lisa, the family wasted no time in moving... However, they later learned that the family who had moved in after them had found their month-old infant dead in its crib. According to the story, the baby had a gash across its chest and its face was badly bruised. The parents, of course, were blamed for the death. Supposedly, the jury on the ensuing trial exonerated them as no additional corroborating evidence could be found. It was a fate that Lisa, Bobby, and the rest of their family had narrowly avoided. Now, our final story also comes from Brad Steiger's case files. To understand it, we must first get a sense of the house in which the experience occurred. Janice said that her childhood home featured a straight line of doors from the outside door to her brother's door to her door opening. Now, a layout that allowed for easy travel from the outside to her bedroom. Now, as for Janice's bedroom itself, her sleeping arrangement featured two windows to the left of the foot of her bed and the bedroom entrance to the right. This is my right and left, just so you guys know. Since her room had been a late addition, there was no door. Now, Janice's family lived in the country and, being familiar with their neighbors, never felt the need to lock their doors. On the night in question, the moon was shining brightly enough to read by, and she was staying up late to enjoy the inviting glow. Now, at some point, a very uneasy feeling washed over Janice. This was accompanied by the distinctive sound of the outside door gently opening and softly closing followed by the sound of someone walking through the living room. And suddenly, Janice became keenly aware that she was now not alone. Someone else had walked into her room. She said this, I was laying down so I could not see the end of my bed. I was too terrified to look. I knew something horrible was standing there. I do not know how long I laid there too scared to look. I finally could not stand it anymore and sat up in bed. It was not a person at all. I sat there frozen looking at it standing in the bright moonlight right at the end of my bed. It was inches from the end of my bed. Its body was facing the window to the left of the end of my bed, and it was hunched over as it was taller than my low ceiling. Its hideous face was turned towards me with its arms held as if creeping. Its body was covered in hair that looked dark. Janice said that whatever it was, the intruder was glaring at her. She instantly felt certain that the thing was going to kill her, and a scream rose within her, but no sound ever came. She was simply too scared. All she could do was sit there, trapped in her bedroom with a gigantic, hairy thing that wanted nothing more than for her to be dead. The only thing Janice could do was, in her words, what any little girl would do. I lay back down and covered my head, expecting to be killed at any moment. I heard it go back out of my room, through my brother's room, across the living room, and back out the door. I still could not make a sound. Now, after laying there for what felt like an eternity, Janice finally found the willpower to scream. She yelled at the top of her lungs for her mother, who rushed to her side and she listened as Janice told her exactly what had happened. Then, to Janice's utter dismay, her mother told 
her what all parents say, that it was just a nightmare and she should go back to sleep and her feelings are not valid. Of course not, because no parent could ever validate their child through a traumatic experience like this. However, this callous decision left a lasting effect on the relationship. Janice felt betrayed. She concluded her letter to Brad Steiger by saying, I did not go back to sleep. It was not a dream. She did not ever come to calm me down. I never trusted her after that. You want my advice? Take Janice's story as a cautionary tale. Even if you yourself don't suffer the misfortune of a visit from the boogeyman, listen to those who do. Be there for them, comfort them, and by all means, keep your guard up. And because you guys made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, boogie woogie, so I know who made it to the end of the video. If you guys enjoyed today's episode and want to see more of this type of content, be sure to go ahead and slap that like and subscribe button for more videos just like this one. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.